Business training, Japanese style. These men are tomorrow's money spinners in the making. One in 11 gets in, no one drops out. The toughest, the most exclusive commercial academy in the East. The young hopefuls of Keirin, Japan's biggest and best in the business of bicycles. This is the Japan Bicycle Racing School. Students train as nowhere else. Ten months of drilling, scrutiny, analysis by camera. We may treat them like dogs, says the college principal. But next year they could be earning a fortune. These steely tutors are fueling an industry, the Japanese phenomenon of Keirin track racing. The Keirin school is financed by the racing industry for the racing industry. Each year, 150 graduates will qualify as professional Keirin racers. They'll be able to compete on Japan's 50 Keirin tracks. Superstars can earn up to a quarter of a million dollars a year. With such incentives, the rigors and self-discipline of the Keirin school can be understood. The stakes are astronomic. Riders at this race meeting have been isolated for three days to prevent nobbling. A billion yen might be wagered at one track in one day. It's formal and strict. Nine riders per race, maybe ten races a day, a meet of up to six days, and nobody can ride more than once a day. The winner of this race could pocket well over a million yen. 75% of the betting goes as prizes, the rest to local government. These are the thoroughbreds, the greyhounds of Japan. Betting's closed. The hair's off, the riders spring their traps. Gently, tactically at first. There could be 30,000 in the velodrome, but it's quiet, almost disreputable. Many older Japanese shun Keirin because of its gambling connotations. The human hair paces the riders as they slipstream and plan their moves. The distance is 2,000 meters, five laps. With the pace's work almost done, the thrill of Karen is about to unfold. The bell is the cue for the hair to peel off, the sprint to begin. Shoulder pads and helmets are no mere decoration. This is rough stuff. They are approaching 70 kilometers an hour. It's this that annually packs in 27 million spectators. And a finish like this. No wonder Keirin can donate $20 billion a year to public works, just 11% of its betting turnover. Profits from Keirin help rebuild post-war Japan, an era when he merged another great bicycle business, the Shimano Corporation. This is the founder's son, one of three brothers who turned a fishing tackle company into the most marketable name in bicycles. Shimano make components, 
more than half the world's derailleur gears, plus everything else that could be hung on a bike. There was certainly a period, uh, perhaps a year ago, two years ago, where the consumer was coming into a bicycle shop to buy a Shimano bike, meaning somebody else's bike with a Shimano group set on it. Shimano's success came with the mountain bike explosion. While rivals like Campagnola of Italy ignored it, Shimano embraced the mountain bike, creating set after set of stylish accessories. I think Campagnola were caught unawares by Shimano, certainly didn't anticipate the level of innovation that was coming out of Japan. Innovation that has meant robotized production in Osaka and tax advantages in Singapore, a joint venture in Italy and ever more chic components. The relentless pursuit of a dream by Shimano's designers. Oh, Shimano invest heavily in research and development. Listen to the voice of the market, they say. With good engineering and sharp marketing, they're the dominant force in world component supply. But Shimano have been a victim of their own success. Overwhelmed by orders, months late with deliveries. They've been unable to meet that demand. And therefore, they have been a difficult supplier to us, and they have interrupted our manufacture and our supply. It's absolutely unhealthy. It's unhealthy and it's very dangerous. And on the top of this, all the bicycles are going to look alike. So we have to be extremely careful. And as far as we are concerned, we are supporting uh, other component makers. Like Saxe Hura to France, but outside the factory with cyclists themselves, Shimano remains top choice. The corporation is well aware of the supply gap. Shimano realized quicker than most that the world is becoming a single bicycle market. The big manufacturers are transnational. The bike is no longer the product of one country. It's a buoyant trade. The North American market is worth $2 billion a year. Western Europe, twice as much. A point not lost on a pushy exporter such as Trek. But long gone are the days when a company like Rally of England had the British Empire as its market. We followed the flag, and therefore it was with uh, Colony, Dominion and Commonwealth that our business was built up. After the 39-45 war, we started to give our Commonwealth countries independence. And the first thing they wanted to do was make bicycles. The result was devastation at the Rally factories. Compounded by the rise of the car, Raleigh's workforce was slashed from 8,000 to less than 1,200 today. Nottingham was no longer the bicycle workshop of the world. My grandfather founded this company in 1895 as a middle-aged man who had immigrated from Germany. He was pretty well educated and worked for the Adler Corporation in Germany. And he came basically because he was fascinated with the most popular machine of the day, which was a bicycle. And for the best part of the 20th century, the name Schwinn has dominated the American market. Cheap, cheerful bikes, because Americans would rather spend money on automobiles. With quality not an issue, Schwinn began to move production to the cheap labor of the Far East. Chicago had once made a million bikes a year. Well, going by here, you know, I could just cry to think that what we are passing here was at one time perhaps the prestige bicycle factory in the world. Yeah. 
Schwinn had moved here to the giant manufacturing company of Taiwan. This is the company chairman. Here, his office staff. And here, his factory workers. Disciplined and highly motivated, and compared with America, a very modest wage bill. Schwinn was back in profit. But Giant had headier ambitions than making other people's bikes. Today, as Taiwan's biggest manufacturer, the company markets under its own name. In less than 20 years, Giant has joined the world league. Uh, I don't think we are more successful because uh, Taiwan only produces now 6 million uh, bikes uh, per year. Uh, Europe is producing more than 10 million, and US more than, more than 10 million. But I think the Taiwan industry is trying very hard and we are concentrated in what I call a new type of bicycles than the traditional one. These frames are carbon fiber, Giant's bold move into ultra lightweight design. The KDEX, as it's called, is expensive, but it could be a world beater. The manufacturing process is so secret it couldn't be filmed. KDEX was born of Giant's prodigious R&D department confirming the company's move into the middle and upper market. This Taiwanese product is no longer cheap. Enthusiastic selling is to Europe, North America, and the Pacific Rim. Giants still supply other manufacturers, chiefly specialized of California. But apart from exercise bikes, the Schwinn deal is dead. In a quest to minimize costs for his cheap American market, Ed Schwinn has moved production to mainland China and Hungary. His pursuit of cheap labor could go on to India, even Africa. Giant have no such problem. With a low-cost workforce, average age 28, they're chasing the expensive Western European market. Bikes come off this production line more slowly because they're for Rotterdam their specifications more rigorous than for elsewhere. Anthony Lowe believes in his staff and technology. We use a lot of a computer you know, for the total manufacturing integrations. And we also have a lot of automations in the machine that's made by ourselves. I think those things also help. Daily briefings keep staff informed. This is a mountain bike frame Giant will make for specialized, engineering at which the Taiwanese have become so much better than the Americans. The order came from the packager and purveyor of quality bikes for America, Mike Sinyard, president of Specialized. I saw an incredible niche in the market. I, I couldn't believe that, that there weren't more quality uh, bicycles available. You know, I was keenly involved in cycling and saw that there was really a shortage of that kind of product or people really even addressing the market. Sinyard builds 150,000 bikes a year. Staff try out new models on lunchtime rides. They help us test them. If we make a product that doesn't work, the people in the company really let us know quickly. It is a, really a statement about the, the philosophy of the company in the sense that we make products for ourselves and that we can be very uh, tough critics about the products. So we're going to have the adjusters on this one? Like yeah, it's got to have it. Have it. Sinyard has bucked the idea that Americans will only buy cheap machines. Essentially, specialized designs, then farms out production to good suppliers, and finally, assembles in California. Because this is just way too flimsy, so I think we should eliminate this tire Specialized is also one of the world's biggest suppliers of water bottles. And they make helmets, tires and shoes, a clearly defined brand image with global appeal. Which is more than can be said of Rally, a seemingly random collection of companies. In Germany alone, the conglomerate trades as Rally, as Rixer, and as Kalhoff. 
These bikes are from Rally of Holland. This from America. Even dealers are puzzled. Rally had sold off many of its overseas subsidiaries. Now, together with the parent company, they've been bought back, saved from years in the doldrums by an energetic holding company, Derby International. It's put a new uh, spirit into the whole business, into management and into the workforce. And finally, of course, it's invested very heavily in new methods. It's essentially a financial organisation headed up by a couple of people who seem at the moment to be interested in bicycles. So much so that Persia was also on Derby's shopping list. But the deal fell through. The strategy behind this was very good. I think it was a good idea to concentrate big groups uh, uh, in the bicycle industry to fight against the importation from China, from Taiwan. Now, the uh, transaction has been extremely long. And at the end, the both group decided that it was so difficult to make the deal that they dropped it. It seems, on the face of it, that it fell through because Peugeot decided there was money in making bicycles. Even without Peugeot, Derby International's rally group has burgeoned to become the world's biggest bicycle manufacturer outside mainland China. But in the UK, where rally dominates in children's bikes, Derby hasn't fully benefited from the general market boom. And it's the same story for all home-based competitors of rally. It hasn't been British companies building more bikes to supply our market. It's been the Far East supplying more bikes to an expanded market. You're talking about the globalization of the bike industry. And it's a question of whether or not the big guys will get bigger and will the little guys go away. And I think almost neither is true. There will be a couple of big players in a global world in the next decade or two. I think we'll be one of them and I think Derby out of England will be the other. We are number one in France, and usually we are number two uh, in the other countries in Europe. So we have different, uh, different competitors. Rally is a big competitor. And Rally's biggest competitor is mainland China. As a third world country, China is flooding Western Europe with cheap, well-produced bikes. They currently get in under the generalized system of preference, or GSP regulations, which says because they're such a developing nation, they should be accorded this, this special benefit. They are the world's largest bicycle makers, making 40 million bicycles per annum. The labor cost in China is one-tenth of the cost of Europe. That's extremely important. And a few years ago, they were not producing so good qualities. But unfortunately, a lot of manufacturers, European manufacturers, have decided to transfer their know-how, their technical know-how, their marketing know-how, and then, from China, are coming good bicycles with very low prices. And if we want to keep the European industry uh, in good shape, we have to fight against this. As bike sales boom, Taiwan may have peaked, Europe and America fought back, and cheap production moved to China. The bicycle is now a global market.